Alright. Well, this is the tournament. Oh, full screen. Alright, can everybody see this? I don't know if the angle is too good. Or the print. Uh, okay, I'm going to talk to you guys today about uh, Rawhide. Um, how many folks here know what Rawhide is? Pretty much everyone? Okay. How many people are running Rawhide every day? Oh, quite a few folks. Good. Uh, so a little background about me. I've been running Rawhide full-time uh, on my laptop, which I use for everything day-to-day uh, -day for about three years now. Um, there have, of course, been issues, but nothing particularly bad. Uh, there have been, in the past, in the distant past of Rawhide, there have been, like, the problems that everybody thinks about uh, for development releases, you know, like uh, uh, glibc getting messed up and your machine will no longer boot, or, you know, those sort of things. But none of that has really happened in, in the last few years. Things have been a lot more stable um, due to a number of reasons, which I'll get into. Uh, I'm a sysadmin by trade, and I've been involved in Fedora for a really long time. Uh, I maintain a bunch of packages uh, in the package collection as well. Uh, a few little notes about Rawhide. Uh, it's the always rolling development release. Uh, new versions of things can appear at any time. So when you expect them or when you don't expect them, suddenly, boom, there's a new version of something. Um, major versions can appear at any time. Uh, minor versions appear all the time. So occasionally, or I'd say the vast majority of the time, things update and you don't actually see that much user visible change. You know, the package is updated, but it updated from 2.0 to 2.01, and it was just a doc file change or something like that. Unless you're looking at it closely, you don't really even notice as much uh, what's going on. Uh, it's not 100% signed, but uh, we're working on that, and actually I'll have some slides on that later, uh, what the progress on that is. It's now a full compose of everything. It didn't used to be. It used to be just the packages tree and a few other things. But now it is a full compose. So it's like all the images, all of the trees, the server, the workstation, the net install, cloud images, you name it. Everything that a release of Fedora would have gets built every single day for Rawhide. Uh, OpenQA is... Uh, now testing all of those things. And so there's a lot more visibility when things are broken. Uh, OpenQA, uh, I believe that talk was earlier today, but there was a talk on uh, OpenQA here. And it's basically a system, automated system where it takes the images and it does the things that a, a human would do. So it boots it up, it chooses install, it runs the install, it clicks on certain things, it looks for certain screens. Uh, and you could see the results of that testing uh, day by day. So that's been really good. Uh, so I pulled this off of the wiki. There's uh, a number of goals for Rawhide. Uh, basically, it's a, a place for people to build the new upstream packages and integrate them into Fedora so they can see that it builds with our compiler or the compiler version there. The libraries kind of all match up, um, things like that. It's also a good way for advanced users to get the newest usable packages. And it's also a place to do incremental change that are too minor for stable releases. So like, as I was saying before, if you have a, a new version of a package that changes you know, some documentation or it's some very minor bug fix or something like that, it may not be worth pushing out to the stable Fedora releases, but you can push it into Rawhide and you know people can see that and uh, test it and make sure that bug fix worked if they're uh, interested in that particular thing. Uh, and it's uh, uh, another goal is to fix issues with packages before they get to the stable releases. So those minor releases or even the major releases uh, that gives them time to be actually used and, uh, and tested. So 
So a uh, little bit about how Rahib is made. Um, there is a cron script that runs every day at 515 UTC. Uh, if you look on pagare.io, uh, Fedora Punji is, is the project. And that actually has a script that goes through the whole process, calling all the things that it calls, uh, creates all the trees, creates all the images. Um, and it usually takes about four or five hours to do all that. Um, it could probably be optimized a good deal. There's a lot of stuff where it, it doesn't do things in parallel where perhaps it could do things in parallel. Uh, but there's also a lot of steps that it has to do in a certain order, like it has to build the trees before it builds the images from those trees and that sort of thing. Um, but you can see all the nitty gritty details in that script if you're interested. Uh, there's also, I didn't put it up here, but there's a mailing list called Relinge Cron, which uh, just contains the output of these sort of jobs. And if you're interested in it, for whatever reason, you can go and look at those. Uh, a lot of the Relinge people are subscribed, but n don't look at it unless there's some problem. You know, if you want to go look and see what happened, you can see the output from everything and you can see where, where problems are and so forth. And some of the output is large, so <laughs> be, be aware. Uh, so why run a rawhide? You like getting new software every day? That's uh, one reason. You like troubleshooting problems, uh, seeing problems get fixed. There's a really good short feedback loop uh, a lot of times with rawhide stuff, um, I found at least. So, you know, you run into some problem and you'll be like, hmm, this is, where is this problem? I'll troubleshoot it down. Oh, it's in this component. I'll file a bug. I'll talk to that maintainer and they'll like, oh yes, I see the bug. I fixed the bug. And then the next day you have a fixed version of this thing. So the release cycle, uh, feedback cycle there is a lot nicer than say a Fedora release where it might be a lot longer before they are able to reproduce the bug, or it might be a lot longer before a package gets to a point where you could test it, or, or uh, that sort of thing. Uh, of course, if you love a challenge, and everyone does. <coughs> and of course, it helps out people that are using stable releases. Um, so you find bugs before those people do. Uh, a lot of packages, um, kind of update in the stable releases and rawhide all at once. Uh, if it's, say it's a security release for some package, they provide updates for everything, but the rawhide one almost always lands before everything else in the stable releases. So I've seen numerous times where, you know, maintainer will uh, push updates for all the releases, the rawhide one will come out, I'll find a problem with that one, file a bug, and then they'll redo all the stable ones. So it's definitely a good, uh, good way to find bugs before everybody else does. We are missing one point. I hate updating updates between stable versions. I can even draw and then I don't have to update. You know, <laughs> I wonder what I do. Basically, update from one stable release to another stable release looks the same as update to raw kite from a week ago to current. <laughs> <laughs> You, you fetch three gigabytes of packages and replace the whole system. <laughs> yeah. There's, uh, I've got some slides here in a little while that I'll talk about the, the rate of change, and it's interesting. Ah, yes, here we go, in fact. <laughs> so I looked at some stats from the last month, and there was one day where there were only 18 packages up, updated. That was the, the slowest day. It was a... Saturday, I think during a holiday weekend, yeah, and there were, July 4th or something like it was yeah. like right before a holiday weekend, yeah. yeah. And then there was another day when there was about 2,500 packages that changed. And uh, no, that was actually, this was a uh, Python uh, got rebuilt. Uh, uh, right. In the side right. tag. Right, in a side tag, and then that's when it was folded back into, into the main rawhide tag. Uh, RPM got a new feature to handle dependencies on Python packages, and in order to take advantage of that, the Python maintainers need, wanted all the packages that are Python to be rebuilt. So the way that's usually done is, you know, they build a new RPM and they set it in a side tag in Koji, and then all the things build against that, and then they're merged back in all at once. Um, now. That seems like a lot, but that actually isn't a lot. The 
the biggest amount that you'll see a rawhide change is right after a mass rebuild of everything. And, you know, those days that you're talking, you know, 22, 23,000 packages, basically every package on your machine is replaced virtually. Uh, so the amount of change is, is high sometimes. <laughs> Uh, I checked also into the mirror manager uh, requests, which I, I thought was interesting. That's the number of people hitting mirror manager and asking for a rawhide uh, mirror. And it varies quite a lot. It's between 12 and 25,000 a day, which actually seems more than I was expecting. But again, that's going to just tell you how many machines hit that or requested that mirror link. Um, you know, that could be some machines hitting it very often or a bunch of machines behind a single IP address hitting it uh, a bunch of times. Or that developers could... requesting information. From... Right, exactly. Anything that, that goes to that metal link, this isn't like unique, uh, uniqueified or anything like that. So, um, Mr. Bill. Uh, Rawhide was first announced in August of 1998, which was about 18 years ago now. You can do it. <laughs> um, yes, <laughs> yes it can, or those using it can, if need be. <laughs> so, um, getting on the Rawhide Trail, this actually turns out to be the more difficult part. Once you're actually once you actually have a Rawhide install and you're just updating day to day, really in my experience, there are very seldom are there showstopper problems where you know your machine is just toast or not functional. But getting that in initial install is sometimes very challenging because the install path is very fragile. Um, so we have OpenQA testing it now, but if anyone has looked at this recently, and I guess I could maybe try and pull it up. I'm not sure if I'm on the net. But uh, it's been broken for the last three weeks or something like that due to installer changes and then um, de uh, broken dependencies in LibreOffice and things like that. And if you actually had a Rawhide install already and you were just updating, DNF would not give you those broken dependencies. You'd just say, okay, and keep going on. Uh, but if you're trying to get a, an actual install, that can be a difficult uh, problem at some point. Uh, Adam uh, Williamson has created a uh, page uh, that uses the OpenQA results. If you go to this nightly.fedoraproject.org, it redirects to Adam's page right now. And it will actually tell you the last rawhide images that passed OpenQA and are installable. Um, and they're quite a ways, quite a while ago at this point. But um, So it may be more productive to just use DNF and install a stable release and then use a DNF update. Uh, you may run into broken dependencies on that, but... Yeah. Exactly. Uh, one, yeah, okay, let's see. Yeah, mixing rawhide and stable, there's a, a, the questions come up a lot where people are like, well, you know, I'm running Fedora 23, but I want LibreOffice 5.1. Can I just install it from rawhide and, and go on my way? Uh, no, I think it's a, a pretty bad idea in most cases. The exception being the kernel, uh, the, since you can have multiple versions of the kernel installed. You can install the Rawhide kernel, boot on it, see if it works for you. If it doesn't, you can just boot on a previous kernel and you're fine. If you're installing some large application from Rawhide, you're going to pull in glibc, rpm, and basically you're essentially moving to Rawhide, whether you want to or not. So it's very difficult to untangle the dependencies if you want to try and do that. Uh, so I'd recommend against that. Let's see. Uh, since there's full images, uh, you know, when they are uh, working, when the install path is working, uh, there's all of the spins, all the labs, all of the net install. Uh, so, you know, whatever method you normally would use to install should 
should function. So if you are foolish enough to want off of the Rawhide Trail after you have been on it for a while, um, some good points or good places to do that are the branching points. We just did that for Fedora 25 uh, a couple weeks ago. And when that happens, when Fedora 25 branches off of Rawhide, there's uh, new Fedora repos packages that go out with the new definition for Fedora 25. And if you want off Rawhide at that point, you just tell it, you enable the Fedora repo and the Fedora updates repo and the Fedora updates testing repo and disable Rawhide and then you go on down that path. Uh, there's a number of folks I think that do that sort of thing. They, uh, after a release, they go to Rawhide, they stay on Rawhide till the branch and then they follow the branch till release and then repeat uh, because they want to be involved in testing the ne next release. Um, particularly, I think the desktop folks do that. Some of the QA folks also do that. Uh, so it's certainly an option. Uh, DistroSync uh, also works, DNF DistroSync, um, if you want to downgrade uh, to a different version or side grade, as the case may be. Um, so there's a, the Rawhide uh, repo definitions are in a sub package of Fedora repos called Fedora repos Rawhide. And it is not installed by default. So if you want to update or side, side date or distro sync or whatnot over to Rawhide, uh, you will have to install that package. Uh, that was changed a while back because inadvertently users were it wasn't, it used to be installed by default and users were going in and saying, I want all the software, so I'm just gonna enable all of these things, Fedora, source, Rawhide, debug info, I'll just turn that all on and update. And of course they would get Rawhide and they'd get confused and so that got changed uh, a while back. Uh, obviously reinstall is another option if you wanna get uh, off the Rawhide trail, just reinstall with a stable release. Let's see. Nice. A note about hardware. Um, in general, things that work in a stable Fedora release are going to work fine in Rawhide. Um, sometimes Rawhide has support that you need. Um, I don't know how many of you here have Skylake laptops. Fair number. That's the more recent Intel chipset. Um, there were a number of problems because Intel released the laptops with that chipset and the support for it was not available in Fedora 23. Uh, and this was before Fedora 24 came out. So in that sort of window, Rawhide actually turned out to be a lot better than the stable release. Uh, just simply because it had the Skylake, Skylake support in the kernel and the uh, X drivers and things like that. Um, so sometimes you'll see that kind of uh, situation. Um, if you use any of the non-free video drivers like NVIDIA or uh, ATI Catalyst or any of those sort of things, uh, Rawhide is probably not a good choice. Uh, usually there's a kernel every day, just about which means you would be rebuilding your modules for those about every day. If they rebuild. If they rebuild. Uh, and they're often very laggy behind versions, even in stable releases. So much less Rawhide, they're often broken and they're not gonna come out with a new release for a while. Uh, I don't know if it's still true, but it used to be that the NVIDIA driver wouldn't work at all because Rawhide kernels have debug, uh, a bunch of debug options enabled. And it turned out there was a problem with their driver and certain debug options where it just wouldn't work at all. So you couldn't even run it with the Rawhide kernel at all. So, so uh, you are using the default kernel or, or the yep. debug information? I, I am using the default kernel. Um, and it does have debugging, but it doesn't seem to really bother me that much. Um, I guess I should have thrown in a thing about uh, the kernel versions. So the default version in Rawhide uh, has 
a bunch of debug info. It used to have a thing called slub debug uh, enabled, and that was that really slowed things down bad. So they actually got rid of that. It wasn't actually that helpful. So they, they turned that back off. Um, also, if the first release candidate of every uh, first release candidate build of every kernel is has no debug enabled. Yeah. So like if 4.70 RC1 comes out, the first kernel build in Rawhide will have no debugging. I mean, I thought it's the stable version. If there is like 4.7 more, there's, there's no debugging for. Right, correct. Right, it's the same way. It's So it's like the first RC1 one will have no debugging, but they'll turn it on again for successive RC1s. RC2, turn it off, etc. That gives you if you want to run without the debugging, you can just stick to the first RC or the final. Oh, okay. um, first RC. Yeah, yeah. There is also another repository, uh, kernel, kernel rawhide no debug, which does every version as no debugging. Uh, the problem with that is if you use secure boot, they're not signed, so you would have to turn off secure boot. And uh, they tend to lag behind, like the builds are done in Koji for Rawhide, and then later in the day, they're done as a scratch build for that no debug uh, repository. So they tend to be, you know, like a day behind, if that matters. Um, but I don't find the debugging to be that big a deal anymore. It, it, is it kind of look a little noticeable, like when you're booting, you can see it takes a little longer, but day to day it doesn't seem to matter that much. Um, all right, one free. Ah, yes, the uh, if you have old hardware, you may have problems, uh, just because if as things are disabled uh, upstream or uh, whatnot, they will be disabled first in Rawhide. So, you know, if you're depending on a really, well, we're still building the 32-bit Intel stuff, at least for the moment, but, um, well, what's a good example of this? If you still use Matrox graphic card, it's time to right. <laughs> right, right. And you probably don't want the the slowness from old hardware when you're dealing with updating lots of packages and rebooting a lot and so forth. Um, all right, so a few tools. Uh, everyone here hopefully is familiar with DNF now. Uh, this is, of course, your first uh, go-to tool for handling Rawhide day-to-day. It does not, but you can sort of you can sort of do it uh, yourself manually. So basically, what I do, uh, and the, this will be mentioned in a later slide for workflow, but I usually update once a day and just pull in you know all the new stuff. And usually, it's pretty quick when you notice a problem in any kind of application that you use a lot, like an email client or a browser or uh, something like that, and you know, one of the first things you can go to there is, oh, well, Firefox isn't starting or something like that. Uh, and there was a Firefox update and the ones that I just did, I'll just downgrade it. Does that one work? Oh, it does. Okay, well, now I know that it's that particular update. Um, if you don't update every day, then you run into problems where you have to go further back because there may have been, you know, several versions between the one you had and the one you updated to, there may have been several versions. You may have to use DNF and say, install this Firefox version. Okay, does it work? Yep, how about this one? And you know, bisect it that way. Um, usually DNF, you don't have to worry about broken depths. If you don't care, you can just do your update. It'll, it'll tell you, oh, I'm not installing these for broken dependencies. You could report a bug on it if you want or talk to the maintainer but it's not going to install those packages with broken dependencies, it's just gonna ignore them. Every once in a while you run into a problem where um, there's some package that you have that maybe you didn't get from Rawhide, you got from a third party or something like that, and it's holding back 
you know, a, a huge bunch of other updates. Uh, for those cases, you can use DNF dash dash best, and it'll tell you more information. It'll tell you what thing this particular package needs uh, to point to where where your problem is, and then you can you know remove that package and update things and rebuild it or uh, get a newer version of that package or or whatnot. Can it have its difference usually when you use a VM version? Right, They're, they tend to lag behind. So if you have, a good example is FFmpeg, which every time it updates, it changes its library SO name. So everything has to be built against it every time. So if there's a something that FFmpeg depends on, or if it updated, you know, you'll have the slew of packages, and if all of them didn't get rebuilt, just most of them, it'll not, you know, you'll have the broken dependency and the old one will be depending on the old FFmpeg. Uh, usually that stuff sorts itself out uh, pretty quickly. So you can just either ignore it for a few days or, or try and track it down with best. Kevin, since you were speaking about downgrading, uh, I remember that Yam was behaving better in this case because they kept the previous version in cache. And the end does not do that. I don't know if it's you can tell. There's a to keep cash. And it's one thing that this was disabled, but maybe it would be helpful, the helpful if there can be the previews composes like for one week kept somewhere around so we yeah. could get the previous version somehow easier. I I've actually I had a request for this a long time ago and I've talked to a lot of the release engineers, and I've never, not been able to convince them, main, mainly Dennis, but uh, it would be nice if we kept the previous version always in the repository, because then you could just DNF downgrade and it would always work, because yes. you'd have the two yes. versions. But the problem with that is, you know, say there's a horrible security bug in version X, you update to version Y, and version X is still in the, in the repository, so... I mean, it's still a question which I should decide, like, if I, I, know. If I, I know. don't have the security bug, I should be able to decide, like, use the right. insecure version, because typically, it, or for me, it might It may not matter, matter right. Yeah. yeah. So. And the another problem with it is that it increases the amount of space. Yeah, of course, it of makes everything twice as big. Yeah. Um, but, you know, we, we may be able to implement something like that. Uh, actually, I believe the next slide, I've got something that mentions that. Um, there's also basically DNF repo query unsatisfied. If anyone remembers yum check, that is the DNF equivalent of yum check. So it tells you of the packages you have installed, do any of them have broken dependencies? Uh, but you shouldn't run into that if you uh, just follow DNF's uh, suggestions. So while uh, the FFmpeg has, uh, you know, not uh, all dependencies have been refilled, it doesn't work? Uh, no, it still works. You still have the old version. It just doesn't upgrade oh, you. Right. So, you know, if you have FFmpeg, they updated that and package A that needs it, but you have package B and it hasn't updated, then you try a DNF update, it'll tell you FFmpeg is not updated because package B needs the old version. Uh, I mean, when you use the dash dash best. It, right. It, that doesn't change anything. That just gives you better reporting. Oh, right. So if you do DNF update, it tells you FFmpeg was not updated or something very generic. If you use best, it'll say FFmpeg was not updated because package B needs blah, blah, blah version, right. which is not provided. Uh, so it gives you more indication of where where the actual Should problem is. Best be uh, they don't want to do that because they think it's too confusing, I guess. I think we make it this. Default now. Oh, no, it's, it's not. not. No. Yeah. And I think it's good. Yeah, I mean, you can still see, for a long time, it actually, uh, for a number of years, DNF didn't report any of the broken dependency stuff at all. So <laughs> you would do a DNF update, it would say, I'm updating these five packages, done. And you'd be like, cool, I'm up to date. But it it resolved that FFmpeg thing and just silently didn't tell you anything about it. So at least now, it does give you like a, a little... A yeah. little blurb. <laughs> DNF is a perfect package to report one bar per week. <laughs> and yes. there is a long time open bug to break 
even make the reporting of the broken data so better because it um, gives us lots of issues when dealing with second reactions and trying to find out what's the real cause. And yep. Oh, oh yes, I'm familiar with that bug. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. When you said like the mixing of stable and raw is not a good idea because you can't really go back and untangle it, doesn't history solve that? Uh, no, because, uh, well, to some extent it might. The problem is any package that changes its, its other stuff that's not packaged. So say you update to the Rawhide version of PostgreSQL or something like that, and it changes the database format, you can't easily go back. Or you update to Firefox and it changes the, you know, your user preferences or whatever. But if it's not something like that, then yeah, you could just do a history undo, blah, 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 provided you had the repository enabled. You need to have all the packages still available to, to do that. But yeah, that, that is an option. And you can exclude or set particular versions in the dnf.conf. And I've had to do this a few times when there's some broken package, I file the bug, the maintainer knows, but it's not updated yet. I don't want to get it every time I update. So, you know, I'll just stick and exclude package version, blah, 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 and it'll ignore it. Um, or, yeah. And usually if you're doing that, it's very good to have the full version in there because otherwise you'll forget that you have it in there and you'll never get any updates from that package again if you just put the package name. So if you put package name dash 1.0 whatever, it's only going to exclude the, the broken version and then it'll get you back on track after that. Okay, uh, Koji, the command line. Um, I don't know how many of you folks are package maintainers, but Koji, the command line client, is actually very useful for non-package maintainers also, uh, especially those folks that use Rawhide. Um, so Rawhide is not 100% signed, but it's mostly signed. We have an auto-sign process that sits there and tries to sign everything, but the problem is the compose starts when it starts, and the auto signer is just signing as it goes, you can run into a case where builds land and are not signed and then the compose starts and then those unsigned packages go out. Uh, you can use the Ko Koji command line tool to download signed packages if they're available for whatever it is that you're trying to get. Uh, I should have put a command line note in there on how to do that, but uh, there's a Koji option to get a package signed by whatever key you wish, uh, if it is signed. Uh, Koji download build is very handy. Uh, if you know, you've updated, Firefox broke, you wanna go back to the previous day's version, but obviously it's not in the repository anymore, you can use download build to get the previous version out of Koji easily instead of going to the web page and like- Or newer. Or newer if you like, yeah. Uh, and this one is interesting. It's something I do, which maybe uh, other people uh, don't want to, but I, I find it handy. Uh, I tend to update once a day after, you know, in the morning, uh, get all the rawhide stuff from the previous day. But if I'm going to update all this stuff and reboot, I would like to get the day's kernel, the, since they're usually about daily. Uh, but a lot of times in the mornings when I'm doing my update, the kernel's still building. And so I could wait till the next day to get that kernel. Or you can go into Koji and actually grab it as long as you're not using ARMv7, because that's usually the last architecture to finish. You can grab the... Uh, this will change. It will, very soon, actually. Uh, but in any case, you can grab uh, things if you... Uh, again, the example, the Firefox example, Firefox is broken. You downgrade it and it works, and you, so you go, okay, well, is there a newer version in Koji? Well, there might be a newer version that's already fixed. You just need to grab that version instead of downgrading, so upgrade. Um, so do you have like an automated trigger script that does it every day? No, I just go in there and look. <laughs> but you really want that kernel, right? Well, if I'm gonna reboot anyway, I <laughs> might as well have the newest one. Um, very handy for getting older working packages. Uh, sometimes 
Uh, there's scratch builds available to test things. Maintainers will sell you uh, test the scratch build and see if it does it fixes whatever. Uh, sometimes I will do a scratch build if I if the problem if I see a problem and I know what it is and I know how to fix it or I think I do. I'll try and do a little scratch build to fix it, and if it works, then I'll tell the maintainer, you know, that's the right fix. Um, so Koji is fairly handy. Uh, <laughs> one, one thing about Koji, if you work with any secondary architecture, then there is ARM Koji, PPC Koji, and S390 Koji. Right. Uh, which just do the same, but connect to the secondary architecture instances. Yep. So a note about SE Linux. Um, I know a lot of folks uh, look, if they run into a problem or whatnot, they would look at SE Linux, but I've noticed a lot of Rawhide using folks don't tend to notice this step. And there are SE Linux bugs that happen from time to time. And so one of the first things you can do if you're debugging a problem, especially a boot problem or um, a desktop login problem or something like that is go to permissive mode and see if the problem persists. Um, I can't count the number of times people, you know, pop up on IRC and say, oh, this is, I can't log in and Rawhide is broken. I'm like, well, it's, it was working for me. All right, let's look at this. Oh, yeah, you know, you try it as uh, permissive mode. Um, these things tend to get fixed fairly quickly. The SE Linux policy maintainers are actually pretty on the ball, but it's a really good debugging, uh, debugging thing to try. Uh, the don't audit stuff, how many people here are familiar with don't audit rules? Yeah, they're kind of, they're kind of sneaky. So SE Linux logs when there are denials, except not if it's a don't audit rule. <laughs> so there are cases where you can say, oh, I don't think it's SE Linux because I didn't see any denials in my logs. Well, I'll try it in permissive mode anyway, just to see. And there are those cases where um, it didn't log, it won't log anything, but permissive mode will fix it. So, um, how, do they, how do the don't audit rules get there? There, there's a list of them in the policy, and you could turn it off. Uh, there's a se module command that turns it off. Unfortunately, then you get flooded with all kinds of irrelevant uh, messages, which is why they're don't audit rules. They're like things usually that shouldn't affect anything and just generate a lot of log noise. Um, but uh, there are occasions, definitely occasions I've hit where uh, things don't work. And uh, another thing to try, or another thing to note here is if you're having some problem and you set, uh, set enforce zero and you're like, oh, well, the problem's still there. Well, try rebooting also <laughs> because uh, someone ran into this just a week or two ago. There was an SE Linux problem in the login process. SE Linux was, or uh, systemd moved something. SE Linux wasn't updated for that yet. And when you would log in, it would not give your user an, a seat. It wouldn't show your user as logged in. And then you couldn't log in off the, at a graphical uh, thing. Just setting that permissive after the fact didn't fix it. You would have to set it permissive and reboot in permissive to, in order to get that process to actually function. So lots of fun debugging. Uh, of course, there's uh, abort and SE troubleshoot D. Um, good for simple stuff. And if you if run into something that crashes and uh, you have an abort report where it can file the bug for you easily, that's great. And then you can just downgrade to the previous working version while that's uh, fixed. Um, nope. uh, gathering news about changes. Um, there's obviously all packages, or most packages, have a change log or a news file or some sort of get uh, information as to what changed. Uh, if you're trying to track down what package is responsible for some particular bug or breakage, uh, DNF logs are very important. 
you can see what packages were updated. Sometimes it's, you know, you think, oh, Firefox isn't running, so it's a bug in Firefox. But then you downgrade it, and it doesn't change anything. And so then you look at what was upgraded. Well, this, 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 this. Well, maybe that's related. And it gives you a, a place to start. Uh, the Rawhide reports on the mailing list uh, are sometimes useful for tracking down when a particular change went out in Rawhide, when a particular version went out. Um, all those are good for uh, looking for more information. Uh, one thing that I use a lot, I have a Firefox alias for it, uh, we have this packages application. And as part of that, it can give you a page with all the bugs for a particular package. So I have a Firefox alias for this, so I can just enter the name of the package and it'll give me the, that bug page. And I find that a really easy place to be able to go and just search for the terms of whatever bug, you know, Firefox crashes on start or, you know, um, GNOME high DPI support or you know, whatever it is that I'm looking for. It's, it's kind of easy to see if there's a bug already filed uh, by going there. And a lot of times in Rawhide, if you're searching for whatever is causing your problem, uh, package maintainers will put uh, bug numbers in the, in the package change log as they rebuild things. And even if it sounds unrelated, I found it to be very useful, you know, say again, Firefox breaks, and the Firefox change log says fixed bug one two three four five. And you're like, okay, so you go look at that bug. Even if it's unrelated, it might be <laughs> still. And a lot of times it is related, and you can actually just comment in that bug rather than opening a new one. Hey, this broke Firefox. It doesn't launch anymore because the previous version works. Um, so that's kind of a nice shortcut. And that gets the maintainer's attention more quickly, I think. Um, mailing lists. Um, it's good to be subscribed to the QA list uh, because there's a lot of discussion there. If something big is broken, you're going to see somebody mention it there. Um, there's also uh, Fedora Development QA on IRC, which uh, folks are happy to... Uh, Just don't ask on Crash Fedora. Yeah, no, they don't like that. <laughs> right, so here's the update cadence. I do daily. Uh, I reboot every time there's a kernel. Um, I do have a rescue media handy. I haven't had to use it in probably a year and a half, something like that, or maybe even more than that. Uh, it just doesn't happen that there's a problem that is that bad. I'm running low on time, I think. Um, so alternatives. It's a good idea to have alternatives. Uh, I, being a crazy person, switch between XFC and known desktops. So I know how to use either one. I can get my work done in either one. And it's very handy to have some knowledge of another alternative there. Say. GDM breaks and you can't log into GNOME, or uh, you know XFC terminal breaks and you can't use that, or or whatever. If you have these alternatives, you can switch to that and debug whatever the problem is. Um, browser XFC basically is a is a good alternate the environment because it rarely change. It's true. It's true. Yep. Absolutely. Um, I have Firefox as a browser, breaks every once in a while, so it's good to have Epiphany installed or Midori or something like that that you can actually still browse if you need to. Um, alternatives also help you troubleshoot, so you can see uh, if a problem in Firefox happens in Epiphany or uh, whatnot. Sometimes testing with a new user is a good idea. You can create a new user account, log in as that, see if the problem still persists. If it does, then it's system-wide. If it doesn't, then it's something in your, your, your user's config. That's right. uh, just a quick note on backups. Backups are as important as ever. Uh, I do backups on my laptop nightly and 
I almost never restore anything, so. Do you but like back up the system partition? I do, um, and occasionally it's useful to go look at old config file or something like that, but it's just, you, you want your data to be preserved. <laughs> uh, a few notes on branched, uh, which we just branched Fedora 25 off Rawhide. <coughs> And for the first part of its life, it kind of lives like Rawhide. It just composes every day, and there's no update system and whatnot. We then enable Bodhi. Uh, you can use Bodhi-D to download updates. So if there's a particular update you're interested in, it'll download all the packages in it for you. Uh, Branch has the advantage of all the new stuff goes into updates testing, and then it only goes into the base repo. So there you have, actually, a way to do a downgrade because the base repo has the old version and updates testing has the new version. Um, Fedora Easy Karma is good for providing updates. Ah oh, yes, a uh, quick note, even further on the edge. If you want to be even further than Rawhide on the edge, Koji has a build root that it uses to build packages. You can, in fact, enable this as a repository. <laughs> Uh, the problem with it is it's not multi-lib, so if you use any 32-bit stuff, it's not going to have that. Uh, it's not signed, and there could be problems where a maintainer builds a package, you update to it, and then they decide, oh, that package is broken, and untag it, and it goes away, and you still have the newer version. But that can be very handy to pull things from if you know that there's, uh, there's some fix. I tend to use that for... Uh, when things are tagged into to, uh, Rawhide, I, look, I use that to update and see if there's any big problems. And occasionally I've used it to look at important things like a new system D and see if it breaks anything, that kind of stuff. Um, you can also grab stuff from Koji. Um, just a few <coughs> more, just another minute or two. Uh, so in the future, we're looking at gating Rawhide and by gating, we mean uh, some steps so that we can know that it's all signed and uh, be able to advertise that. Uh, the install path, we're talking about gating on OpenQA. So OpenQA says, hey, this all passed. Then we can push that out. If it says this didn't pass, then we, don't we just don't advertise those images. We keep the last working images that are available. Um, and maybe update the images once a week, something like that. Uh, more automated testing, Taskatron hooked into it. Um, the multiple versions thing that we were talking about earlier. Ah, and we're at the end. So, questions? Speaking about multiple versions, if you look at Debian, Debian has this snapshot.debian.org, which gives basically all package versions ever existed. <laughs> Are there plans for such service for Fedora? Not that I know of. I mean, Koji has them all. So I would say it would be perhaps feasible for a DNF plugin that did that, that talked to Koji. But yeah, I haven't. But the problem seen. is in dependencies, right? So if there's right. a large chain of dependencies. You would have to find the whole tree, yeah. Yeah, and actually, Koji does not have uh, those. They are if they are. Uh, well, if you download just from Koji, go to the web page and click download, you get the unsigned version. But if you look at the command line, you can tell it, Koji, download this build signed by this key. And if, if it is, if it has been signed by the key, you'll get that signed version. So there is a way to download them signed from Koji, if they're signed. Anything that's been released has been signed. So. Except sometimes it actually garbage collects the side of RPS. If it's an end of end of life reliefs or it's not something that's still tagged in, yeah. Uh, do you have experience with the standard ruling distro like uh, I don't know Arch Linux? Could you compare? Uh, I don't. I have those sort of appeared after my okay. my uh, use of Rawhide, but um, yeah, I don't know. I, I haven't used Arch. I've heard quite a bit about uh, SUSE's tumbleweed, and that's a very interesting thing. They sort of do a rawhide version where they uh, do rawhide and then they test it a bunch and then release a, like a snapshot every week or two, something like that. 
So it's, it's slower than Rawhide, but more stable perhaps, because it's gone through the, the QA. And we want to try and gate Rawhide with OpenQA, and I think that'll help that as well. Um, I think Rawhide is a rolling distribution. Some people argue with me about that, but. Um, okay. And I think some people like that sort of thing, but most people don't, uh, because you do not have any control over when major things land. So like say you're a document developer and you depend on LibreOffice, you use it you know, full time. If you're on a true rolling release, you get the new version of LibreOffice when your distribution rolls it to you. And so you know, maybe you're working on a big contract or something like that, you don't want it. You, you have to have a way to downgrade. Right. On our true limit, the component downgrade and just does everything for you. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> Yep. So in the in the Fedora world, you would say, I mean, those people would want to stick to a stable release, and then, oh, I need to re upgrade to Fedora 25. I'll schedule that, you know, next weekend when I have time. So yeah, that's that's you could, but you don't know. You don't want to. Like right. You don't know it's broken. Well, you you don't know it's there until it's. On there. <laughs> it's, it's not, it can be not LibreOffice fault as well. Yeah. Sure, absolutely, absolutely. So and Chrome, Chromium and Chrome are crashing in row right now. It's not their fault, right? It's because Glyphs was updated. Right. Yep. Yeah. Sometimes it's hard to track those things down. I, yesterday I did Fedora 24 uh, VM installation just to get working in Chrome. <laughs> when I ran Rawhide in press, it worked fine, but try to press, try to press anything and get any, any reaction. Impossible. Huh. Yeah, I, I actually uh, started doing this presentation on Impress in Rawhide, and it was really slow. Like, you would type a sentence, and then, you know, maybe have 30 seconds later, it would start to appear. It's so. So that may have been the same thing you saw. So I switched to Hovercraft, and it's much easier. <laughs> How long have you been running Rawhide? About three years, full time. Yeah. Uh, since my last, well, actually before, I, I had a Rawhide install that was using ButterFS, and uh, that didn't uh, go too well. I had crashes and data loss and really? nastiness. Yeah. And then I reinstalled, and I had that same install was, since then. Was it the fault of BKFS? Yeah. What's the special? The special? I don't know what caused it, um, but I worked with one of the developers, and he gave me a tool that got like a lot of data back, but not all of it. <laughs> it was bad. Okay. This was three years ago, though, so that's a long time in yeah. file system. Because I think snapshots on BKFS are you know, uh, the best, mm -hmm. and it's very good, especially with rolling distro, that you can you know, go back before the update. Right. But yeah, if it destroys your data, it's not that good. Yep. <laughs> Anything else? Anyone? All right, I mean, well, think. Oh. So on the ButterFS point, uh, I use ButterFS on my laptop. I don't actually run Rawhide, mm -hmm. but uh, I use ButterFS on my laptop and snapshot the whole thing, including mm -hmm. boot. Mm -hmm. So like that includes all your kernels, sure, whatever right. you snapshot in yep. the past. And that's Pretty good model. I think it would help Rawhide as long as ButterFS stays stable, yeah. right? So that's that's the dependent factor. You right. don't know when that's going to break right. if it ever does. But you, you could do the same thing with LVM, right? If um, you wanted, but yeah. Do you have a boot like a sub volume? You no, know, it's, it's just all <coughs> one. Yeah. So that makes it simple. But uh, I have some a blog about it. If anybody wants to go read it, sure. it's dustymeg.com and search for ButterFS. Okay. All right, well, thank you guys very much.